so I don't know how familiar everyone is about the residential school system in Canada. Have you started to talk about that at all in, in school? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. So the Inuit residential school system uh, experience was a little bit different than the experience of, of people in the South. So we'll just start off with that. So this, the school system itself, uh, from the 1830s to 1996 when the last school closed, so thousands of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children were forced to attend the schools in an attempt to assimilate them into the, the dominant culture. The mental, physical, and spiritual abuses suffered by these children not only had a deep impact on the children themselves, but also on their families and communities. Just to let you know, myself, I'm not an Aboriginal person, but I did marry into a family that had had uh, um, some traumatic experiences in residential school and that filtered down and so as a result um, I've experienced the intergenerational impacts of, re of residential school. One of the reasons why I work where I work at the Legacy of Hope Foundation it's our mandate to go out and to do events such as this and to talk about people uh, to talk to people and get a dialogue going about the residential school systems. So why is it important to non-Aboriginal Canadians? Why should it matter to a Canadian who never attended residential school? It matters because it happened here in our country, a land considered a world leader in democracy and human rights. It matters because the residential school system is one of the major causes of poverty, homelessness, substance abuse, and other forms of violence against Aboriginal Canadians. Another one of the impacts that, that is often cited by survivors is that their parents didn't know how to be parents because people that attended residential schools were raised in an, in an institutional environment and, and didn't experience family and parental love. It matters because Aboriginal communities suffer levels of poverty, illness, and illiteracy, which one would expect to find in a developing nation. You may have heard of Attawapiskat, uh, the Northern First Nations community that was having a housing crisis. Uh, these people were, were, many people were still living in tents and inadequate housing when the temperatures are dropping down to minus 30. And that, that's kind of a surprising thing to think that is happening in this day and age in Canada. It matters because we share this land, and we may not be responsible for what happened in the past, but we are responsible for our actions today and for what happens in the future. We were far away from home, very far away, emotionally, geographically, and spiritually. That's a quote by Marius Tungalik, um, a survivor of the residential school system. And it really embodies, especially the, uh, the northern experience, what a lot of survivors have told us, uh, that they were, they were moved from their communities and taken away from their families and shipped like you know, thousands of kilometers away. So residential schools um, may include industrial schools, boarding schools, homes for students, hostels, billets, residential schools, residential schools with a majority of day students, or co any combination of, of the above. And for Inuit peoples, especially in the Labrador area, it also included tent uh, encampments. The, uh, in Ottawa here, we have the, the largest um, population of, of Inuit people outside of the north. And a lot of those, those people had come here as students in the late 50s and early 60s. While these residential schools existed in Canada since 1831, it wasn't until the 1950s that they started to spring up up north. And that was uh, also to do with the pol political climate in Canada at the time. If you think um, just after World War II ended, Canada was very concerned with the, the sovereignty of, the, of the, uh, the northern region. So they relocated people from their more southerly uh, Arctic communities to, to the more northerly ones. And at the same time, the, the residential schools started to appear. So yeah, it wasn't until the 1950s uh, that, uh, that the residential school system in the north really sort of picked up steam. In the Northwest Territories, prior to 1955, less than 15% of school-aged Inuit children were enrolled in residential schools. Many children at this time were still living on the land with their families, but even those who lived in the communities and settlements were engaged in seasonal activities and in learning the traditional skills and knowledge that they would need to become active members of, of Inuit society. But when they were taken away at such a young age, they didn't have a chance to learn a lot of these traditional skills. People are rediscovering them again today, um, but, but it, it, there's a whole generation that, that doesn't speak the language often and that don't have those, those skills. 
Unlike in the South, where the changes to Aboriginal communities were spread out over a century of increased Western European contact, um, in the North, Inuit culture had remained relatively intact and unscathed until the mid-20th century. So it was a time of, of great turmoil for a, a lot of these people who were experiencing you know, being relocated, uh, uh, cultural change, and, and then having the kids taken away from, from the families into residential schools, everything all at once. Beginning in the late 19th century, and much earlier in Labrador, Christian missionaries were dispatched to the Arctic and subarctic, but it was not until the 1910s and 20s that massive numbers of Inuit were rapidly and almost wholly converted to uh, Christianity. At the same time, Hudson's Bay trading posts had been established throughout the North, encouraging Inuit to abandon their semi-nomadic lifestyle and to settle in communities that were, uh, um, that were set up around the posts. So what happens is that the people become, uh, they, they're abandoning their old ways and becoming increasingly uh, dependent on the Hudson's Bay to provide them with all the things that they would need. Seemingly overnight, the Inuit populations were becoming concentrated into settlements, threatened by disease and made dependent on trade goods. These changes ushered in a new era of impoverishment of an Inuit culture that in the span of a few decades would have devastating long-term consequences. So people no longer eating their traditional foods, that they would be supplementing their diet with um, you know, flour and lard, that, that sort of thing. These foods that were very foreign to them. Amidst this cultural turmoil and colonization, the, Inuit, uh, the Indian residential school system was introduced across the north and children were taken from their, their homes in, in large numbers. And they often lost uh, any kind of contact with their culture. And as I had mentioned, they, they uh, were often forbidden to speak their own language. By 64, uh, 1964, the number of school-aged children, uh, Inuit children attending the schools, had risen to over 75%. Some children started uh, school as young as four or five. Others were teenagers. Some attended for a short time, while others spent their entire youth in the residential school system. Many students only saw their parents once a year. Some were unable to return home for years at a time because of the difficulty and expense of northerly travel by plane or, for boat, uh, or by boat. And of course, the great distances that we had to travel just to go to school. And if you think about back in the 1950s, uh, not everyone had a phone back then, especially up north. And there was definitely nothing like the internet. Uh, and even today, uh, if you're not in a, one of the major centers up north, um, the internet connectivity is, is very spotty. But that's something to think about. If you think about yourself as a student and being taken away from your family at a young age, at seven years old, just think about how lonely and isolated you would feel. And especially when you couldn't communicate in the language that you knew, your mother tongue. So many survivors have expressed gratitude for the education they received. It can't compare to the suffering and loss that many experienced as children. And the long-term hardships that the system has, has wrought uh, for the families, the survivors themselves, and their communities. Furthermore, Inuit children were made to feel ashamed of their traditional way of life, and many acquired disdain for their parents, their culture, their centuries-old practices and beliefs, and even for the foods that their parents provided. They would have gotten used to the foods that they had been served in the schools, and, and, you know, and would have come home and, and, and not been used to the foods, the, the country foods that their parents had served. Along with being educated in English or French in northern Quebec, Inuit children had to follow an entirely southern Canadian curriculum, which was completely foreign and often perplexing to children who had little or no exposure to the southern world. So they would have been looking at textbooks that had pictures of cars and suburban homes and, uh, you know, and Dick and Jane and Spot, that sort of stuff. And this was, uh, you know, not within their purview. Most significantly, a staggering number of residential school survivors had made serious allegations of mental, physical, and sexual abuse by those responsible for their care and custodianship. In addition to sexual abuse, many students saw or experienced physical abuse and or psychological abuse. There's many um, stories of, of children being punished very harshly, uh, being corporal punishment, or, or being made to, or, or being denied food, uh, very harsh punishments. For, for seemingly small transgressions. For the majority of students who attended residential schools, those wounds have left deep scars that continue to affect many aspects of their daily lives. Unfortunately, many of these negative impacts of residential schools have been passed on to subsequent generations. It, a lot of the students in the schools that were abused um, became the abusers in school and also when they returned to their 
home communities and in amongst their, their own family members. Fortunately, survivors and their families are beginning to seek help and to help each other in unprecedented numbers. Their brave efforts are supported by a number of recent programs and organizations working together to heal the legacy of residential schools in Canada. You may have heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Furthermore, many survivors are embarking on their own path to healing. They are overcoming feelings of fear and shame, breaking the silence, restoring family networks, and addressing the loss of language and, and uh, starting to return to their traditional cultural practices, um, which were lost at, at the residential schools. Nunavut survivor Salima uh, Salamiva Witaluk has expressed what many survivors now feel. I have hope for everybody to heal and to let it out. So what she's saying is that just to talk about it, especially amongst other survivors, and to talk to, to young people about it, to sort of get the word out, to raise the awareness, um, hopefully will have a positive effect. And I think that's where we say thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone have any thoughts or questions or anything they wanted to ask? Yes. What the um, uh, A lot of uh, uh, a lot of porridge, a lot of oatmeal kind of based foods. I don't know if I mentioned that the Brantford Industrial School was nicknamed the Mush Hole because it was it was gruel for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, often, too, uh, if the kids are used to country foods, like they would eat frozen fish or, you know, have seal as part of their diet, especially the, the, the northern kids, or, or venison, you know, for the, for the southern kids, uh, and fish. Uh, they, their diet would be, there was a lot of bread, and, they, and the bread would be not spread with butter, but with lard or with fat. Um, so a lot of carbohydrate like that and, and, and very uh, scant meat products. Um, a lot of the schools had farms attached to, <coughs> to them that the children would work, so they would raise their own vegetables. There was a lot of potatoes, carrots, root vegetables, things that were easy to store. Um, they certainly weren't enjoying like lots of uh, delicious desserts and pastries like that, although there are stories that, that the, the, the people uh, that were running the school would enjoy uh, a better quality of food than the students themselves. So. And when you think about, too, that how food to a large degree determines our well-being and morale. Like if you had the same food for every meal, day in, day out, it gets boring, it's not nutritionally sound, and, it, and you just feel crap. There you go. Thank you. Yeah.